Yamuna Tiravana Chari Chaya Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari Gopi Janavalaba Kirivara Dari Gopi Yashodanandana Brajajana Ranjana Yamuna Tiravana Chari Chaya Radha Madhava Kunjabihari Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Jaya Prabhupada, 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 Jaya Prabhupada. Srila Prabhupada ki jai. Jayam Vishnu Pad Paramahansa Paribhajikacharya Stotara Sata Sri Srimad is Divine Grace A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai Grantara Srimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai All glories to the assembled devotees uh, You can off Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya 
ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय So we're reading from 11th canto, chapter 28, text number 38. Yogi no pakva yogasya Yunjata kaya uttitai Upasargaya vihanyeta Tatrayam vihito vidi Yogi no pakva yogasya Yunjata kaya utitai Upasargaya vihanyeta Tatrayam vihito vidi Yogi no pakva yogasya Yunjata kaya utitai Upasargaya vihanyeta Tatrayam vihito vidihi Yoginaha of the Yogi Apakva Yogasya, who is immature in the practice of yoga. Yunjata, trying to engage. Kayaha, the body. Utitai, which have arisen. Upasargai, by disturbances. Vihanyeta, may be frustrated. Tatra, in that connection. I am this. Vihita is prescribed. Vidhi, recommended process. So translation and purport by the disciples of His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada. The physical body of the endeavoring yogi who is not yet mature in his practice may sometimes be overcome by various disturbances. Therefore, the following process is recommended. Please repeat, the physical body of the endeavoring yogi who is not yet mature in his practice may sometimes be overcome by various disturbances. Therefore, the following process is recommended. Purport. Having described the process of cultivating knowledge, the Lord now gives instructions to the yogi whose body may be disturbed by disease or other impediments. Those inferior yogis who are attached to the body and bodily exercises are often incomplete in their realization, and thus the Lord here offers them some assistance. Omagyana timarandasya gyananjana shalakaya Chakshurun melitam yena tasmai shri gurave namaha 
Shri Chaitanya Mano Bishtam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Swapatantikam Vandeham Shri Guru Shri Uttaparakamalam Shri Guru Vaishnavangscha Shri Rupam Sagrajatam Sahagana Raghunatan Vitang Tang Sajivam Sadvetam Savadutam Parijana Saitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishakan Vitangscha He Krishna Karuna Sindho Dina Bando Jagatpate Gopisha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostute Tapta Kanjana Gorange Radhe Vrindavaneshwari Vrishabhanu Sute Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Vanchagalpa Tarubhyascha Kripa Sindhubhyevacha Putita Nang Pavanebhyo Vaishnavebhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasari Gaura Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Ram Hare Ram 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 Hare Hare Reading the translation again. The physical body of the endeavoring yogi <clears throat> who is not yet mature in his practice can sometimes be overcome by, by various disturbances. Therefore, the following process is recommended. So first of all, I'd like to seek the blessings of all those who are assembled physically and also online uh, because I cannot perform this service unless I have all your blessings. So this verse is actually a transitional verse. So that gives me the opportunity to give a bit of a recap of the rest of the chapter. But before I'll do that, I'll open up with a story. And this is a story that was uh, told by Achyutananda Prabhu. It's in his book called Blazing Sadhus. So this happened in 1966 and uh, Charles, he had uh, been coming for some of the programs <coughs> and in one program, in one lecture, Srila Prabhupada was speaking uh, on this uh, verse in chapter 9 of Bhagavad Gita, chapter 9, text 4 and text 5, um, how maya tatam idang sarvam Jagat Avyakta Murtina. How the Lord is saying that um, I'm in everything, but in text 5 he's saying, and yet at the same time I'm not in everything. So Charles was confused how something can be in everything and also not in everything. So one late afternoon <clears throat> he took the courage to go up to Srila Prabhupada's apartment. And uh, in 1966, Srila Prabhupada lived in an apartment behind the matchless gifts or uh, storefront. And in those days, uh, New York was very uh, polluted and there was a lot of crime. And especially in that area, like you'll, he, you'll read in some of the uh, biographies that there was a funeral home opposite the uh, 26-second Avenue Center. A funeral home is not, like in India, we have this understanding of burning bodies, cremating. But in, in the West, uh, it's, about, it's all about burial. So in order to bear, bury the body, you need to do a whole bunch of all kinds of preparation for the body. It's, I don't want to go into details. But that was happening just across the street. So that energy was there and right beside the temple. It's not there anymore, but there used to be a gas station. So a lot of noise and of course a lot of bums around. So... Uh, Achyutananda, he went through all of this and up to Srila Prabhupada's apartment and he knocked. And Srila Prabhupada said, come in. And he was at his uh, desk and he was typing. At that time he was uh, doing a lot of typing. And uh, 
Achyutananda asked if he could ask a question. And Srila Prabhupada, he actually did not even uh, get up from his work. He just continued and he said, yes, sure, ask your question. So he asked this question, how can the Lord be in everything but at the same time not in everything? So Srila Prabhupada immediately, without any hesitation, without any contemplation, he gave a very nice analogy, which all of you know very well, but he gave a lot of details to that analogy. The analogy is of the sun. And the sun shines on the earth, the rays, they hit the earth, and from the earth come all kinds of plants and trees. And one of those trees, though it's connected to the sun, it's so separated from the sun that it's actually giving shade. You know, people can avoid the sun by going underneath the tree and getting shade. But he said that if you take a branch from that tree, it's a, I mean, it should be a dead branch, uh, you can chant, I mean, he was saying in previous ages, people would, uh, the, the, the priest would just chant mantras and invoke the fire because the fire is actually within the branch, within the tree, though you don't see it. And it can come out either by a lighter, by, by flame, or by mantra. So in this way, something can be outside but inside simultaneously. And Achyutananda was very satisfied with this answer. And uh, he took his leave and as he was leaving, Srila Prabhupada, you know, he's still like typing. He looks at him and he says, thank you very much for your question. And when Achyutananda came out, I described the scene before, very dark and miserable. He said, it was like the world had transformed. It was all bright. He, didn't go, he doesn't go into details, but it was a different world for him. And he, he was thinking, this personality, he had not accepted initiation yet. He said, this personality, he's just doing his work and he's answering my question, which is one of the most difficult questions to answer. Uh, philosophers and religionists have been debating, have been discussing this, these type of questions, you know, for, for millennia. And he's just answering it so simply. And on top of it, he's thanking me. He's thanking me for asking this question. So then, at that point, he, he concluded that I really need to tell people about what I have found. So I'm telling you this story because it gives me a lot of inspiration that trans transformation can happen um, through association of a pure devotee. And I, I've been meditating on this and this, actually w this is actually which gives me a lot of inspiration to keep uh, hearing from Srila Prabhupada in the form of lectures, morning walks, conversations. So <clears throat> last year, uh, some of you may know I was uh, in Kerala and I was taking treatment and it was like a lockdown for me. I didn't realize it then, but I realize now that it was a preparation for me. Um, for two months, I was stuck there. Uh, initially, I was with a few other devotees, but after two, three weeks, they left, their treatment was finished, and I was alone. And I don't know if anyone has been there, but uh, if you do treatment for your uh, head, like Shirodhara, things like that, they, they don't allow you to go outside. <laughs> Only 15 minutes in the morning before the sun gets too high. And they don't allow you to read. I mean, if you, everything is choice, but they recommend you not to read because when you read, it's, especially devotees, we read for many, many hours, it strains our eyes and then we can easily, especially some of us can easily get headaches 
so like this, no reading. So I was thinking, what am I going to do uh, for, you know, one and a half months by myself? So I thought, okay, well, uh, let me get into a program of hearing lectures from Srila Prabhupada. And I got the inspiration from Shruti Kirti Prabhu. I was hearing a class, Shruti, Shruti Kirti Prabhu was uh, describing in 1975, uh, he was with Srila Prabhupada, and this happened in Atlanta. Many of you know this pastime. Uh, Srila Prabhupada began singing a bhajan, and he became so overco overcome with ecstasy after just a few minutes that he couldn't continue. So interestingly, Shruti Kirti Prabhu was describing what happened after that, especially in the evening. Uh, he was describing how Srila Prabhupada was still in a different world. And uh, he was like describing about the gopas and like he was totally absorbed in Vrindavan consciousness. And Shruti Kirti Prabhu was saying that they were on a world tour and it had actually started many months back and there was a cum cum uh, cumulative effect meaning through the travels he had noticed Srila Prabhupada uh, not expressing, not showing ecstasy but it, it, he was saying it was, it was building up until it finally like came out in Atlanta. So I was thinking, well, maybe I should listen to all those lectures and just try to see if I can also experience that build-up. So I went in, in into my uh, audio folders and I went, so in 1975, Srila Prabhupada started his tour in India and uh, he went to Hawaii, no, to Japan and from Japan to Hawaii and so I, I took that section of uh, lectures and I began listening every day. And uh, it was a transformation for me. So I recommend that if you're like uh, not so inspired or like a little bit lethargic in your hearing of Srila Prabhupada, take a section take a section of, verse, of, of, of lectures, that means a chronological section, and listen to those. Like even in Mayapur during one yatra, Shivaram Swami was making the same point during his Vyasa Puja, like his disappearance class. He was saying, I listened to that last section of classes Srila Prabhupada gave in uh, mostly Vrindavan, actually from Rishikesh to Vrindavan in 1977. And it, it blew my mind and he was, he was actually encouraging, he was recommending everyone in the audience to uh, hear, to do the same thing. So that's my little recommendation uh, during this time of the lockdown, get absorbed in hearing sections of Srila Prabhupada's classes. Okay, so now we'll start the class. So I'm going to speak about four things. The first thing is the flow, because like I said, this is a transitional verse. And the second thing is uh, some of the disturbances because this verse specifically speaks about dealing with disturbance. And third point I will speak about is how we can see Krishna, like how, how Krishna is glorified in this verse. And the last point is we'll speak a little bit about the three personalities. Uh, who appeared and disappeared today. So the flow. So I highly recommend uh, if anyone is either giving class before the end of this chapter or really wants to see the connections between these verses uh, to look at Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur's uh, commentaries on these uh, uh, verses in chapter 28 of this uh, canto. Uh, so I am, I know I don't have enough time to go through all the verses, to show all the connections. So I just picked a few, just to kind of uh, give us context before we dive into the specific verse today. So 
In 20, chapter 27, we know that uh, Lord Krishna was speaking to Uddhava about uh, deity worship. And then 28, he immediately goes into jnana. He doesn't even, he's not, there's no question. Uddhava doesn't ask a question. But by text 10, Uddhava uh, asks a question. And a very interesting question he asks. He says that, actually he makes a statement first. And then he asks the question. So the statement he makes is that the body and the soul neither can be experiencing this material existence. That's his statement. The body and the soul are neither experiencing this material existence. And then he qualifies by saying, well, the body is just dead matter. How can it experience anything? Like if I, if I, you know, touch this uh, vyasa san, it's not, it's not able to experience my touch. And, th but, and then he says, the soul also is not the experiencer because it's transcendental. He, he gives actually seven different qualities. And the first quality he gives is that the soul is uh, having innate knowledge, chit. So if it's all knowing, if it's knowing that this world is temporary and really if it's temporary, it's false, then it can't actually be experiencing it. And a good, good example or a good analogy to give is of uh, watching a movie. Like if you watch the end of a movie, then watching that movie again is different, right, than the first time. So, so actually the soul knows the end of the movie, knows, knows what's going to, like we all know, that's our, that's our situation, we all know what's going to happen, uh, how, like that we're all going to leave. But still, we continue to keep watching the movie over and over and over and over. So, this was Uddhava's question. That, because if you understand who is the experiencer, then you can focus there and you can, you know, detach so that you can get out of this experience, this material existence. So, Lord Krishna, many times he will uh, give a direct answer and then he will kind of uh, give a breakdown. So, his direct answer is that there is a relationship between the soul and the body and the senses. And it, so it's that relationship. And he says, how it happens is through ignorance. And why it happens? Uh, because, well, he gives an, an uh, Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur gives an analogy of, the, of a dream that uh, in the dream, you don't actually realize that it's a dream. So then you get to experience stuff. Um, now that leads, okay, so if it's not, so, so Lord Krishna is emphasizing the relationship. And then later on, he explains things like fear, confusion, uh, happiness, harsha, these qualities, they are actually uh, not of the Atma. Uh, he gives a nice proof. He says like uh, when someone is in deep sleep, uh, their false ego is absent. And so then these qualities are not there. So, there, so using that proof, he says that actually it's the false ego. These qualities come from the false ego. And uh, so the false ego is responsible for these qualities, but this is the interesting thing, is that the false ego also does not experience these qualities because it's also unconscious, like dead matter. So if the false ego is not the experiencer, then who is? It's a very interesting question. So, he says, uh, though, the f though these qualities, you know, like confusion, 
fear, uh, happiness, uh, they, are, uh, they are not the Atma, they are not the soul, then why does the soul accept them and experience suffering in this material existence? So he was, he's saying that it's because the false ego is actually imposed by someone. And that someone is Kalayati. It's there in the Sanskrit. Kalayati means the Lord in the form of the time factor. So when that happens, then uh, after the false ego has been uh, imposed onto the soul, then there's guna and karma. And that continues the cycle of material existence. And then he also says how to get free from this bondage to false ego. Uh, first of all, he says that this false ego is rootless. Like rootless means you cannot find the root. You, can, you know, like, cannot keep going back to try to find where it's coming from. No root. And then he says it's also perceived in many forms. So in other words, he's saying it's very difficult. But, he says, the only solution is by the sword of knowledge. That's what the Gyani does, is he takes this knowledge and he cuts. But what if that sword is blunt? He cannot cut. So, VCT, he specifically says, you sharpen that sword by bhakti, which I found very nice. So, uh, almost done, the flow. Uh, so he's speaking about the jnani and he's saying that a liberated jnani, he becomes one in quality with the Lord and he's not affected by the false ego. And because he's not affected by false ego, then he's not affected by the gunas and then he's not affected by material existence. And he gives the example of the sky. You, you've all heard this example of the sky. So much going on in the sky, but it's unaffected. And then, so, so the question was in text 10 and 11, and text 12 to 26 uh, is describing this liberate, I mean, ending with the liberated yogi. But then, uh, the Lord, uh, he takes one step back, and in text 27, he talks about an unperfected jnani and how he cannot act like a liberated jnani because he's still attracted to the sense objects. And he gives a nice example. He says, improperly diagnosed diseases that uh, they cause repeated distress so he says, similarly, uh, an unperfected jnani, uh, he has contamination in his mind, and he also has that uh, previous karmas, the, we could say the, it's not prabda, it's more the bija and the kuta. So these two things cause him suffering. And then we go forward a little bit more. And in text 33, uh, Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur mentions that jnana is how you destroy ignorance. So, therefore, it's accepted. Like, this is the difference between a yogi and a jnani. Is they, mo they both may be doing asanas, they both may be doing um, rituals and stuff, but the difference is that the jnani has accepted this knowledge. It's an important point. And... Because of that knowledge, he realizes that, his, that the soul is always there, it's eternal. And then he's able to be aware of the soul. If you realize you're eternal, then you're aware of yourself. So this is like a, a, a test. Like if we want to know if we're making advancement, we should see how aware we are that we are souls, especially in provoking situ situations. And uh, another example he gives is of the sun. I, I found this interesting example. 
the sun comes up and it, it provides us the ability to see objects. But he says that the sun does not create the eye. All it does is it removes the darkness. So he said similarly this knowledge, it, it takes away the covering of ignorance. But the interesting thing is that knowledge is already there. Behind, uh, underneath the ignorance. The innate knowledge is already there. The soul is full of knowledge. So it's not that it's creating knowledge. We're not, we're not like all of what we're learning is already there within us, but the, the process is to clean away the ignorance and allow that innate knowledge to come out. And the last uh, point I wanted to make uh, in this flow is in text 37. So, uh, last few verses, like especially yesterday, uh, Brajit Chandrapur was speaking about dualities. So, I also was thinking along the same lines, but when I went through the whole chapter, I realized that uh, duality can have other meanings too. So, uh, another meaning is that uh, well, to explain the meaning, in text 22, uh, Vishnu Chakrabarti Thakur, he makes a point that there's no difference between the cause and the effect. And then he gives the example of threads and cloth. So threads and cloth, they're both the same material. So in that sense, they're non-different. Uh, but then he poses a an argument that we see that the effects, for example, like gross matter, uh, it appears different. Uh, so that difference, that's duality. So is, does, is it different? So in order to know if it's different, we have to understand uh, what is real. And he gives the definition that real is something that has no beginning and no end. So, if that's the definition of real, then there's actually only one thing that's real. So, and that's, so, so that, that's how uh, we can understand duality. That when we see two things, then there's duality. So that one thing, of course, is the Supreme Lord and his multifarious energies. And so the conclusion of this flow is, this is, I mean, this is from my own observations, that uh, the Lord goes through five different stages of practitioners. Like I mentioned how he, he was talking about the liberated soul and then he went to the imperfected uh, uh, Gyani. So that's two, but there's three others. So this is the breakdown. So from text 12 to 26, he talks about the liberated soul. From 27 to 37, he talks about the unperfected Gyani. Then from text 38, which is today's verse, to text 40, he talks about the unperfected Yogi. Uh, which is, like I said, someone who doesn't have that knowledge. You will see the next couple uh, um, verses. Uh, he's just doing asanas and pranayam. And then the fourth stage is the, I, I, I put in quotations, the perfected yogi. Someone who uh, keeps doing the asanas and gets siddhis. And then the last stage, which is the last verse of the chapter, talks about the bhakti yogi, kind of nicely brings it full circle. So the second point I want to speak about is disturbance and which is specifically mentioned in the verse. Uh, translation, the physical body of the endeavoring yogi who is not yet mature in his practice may sometimes be overcome by various disturbances. And if you look at Vishwana Chakravati Thakur's commentary from text 38 to text uh, 41, it's very interesting. 
uh, how he uh, analyzes the disturbances. He puts them into three categories, Adhyatmika, Adhibhautika, and Adhidaivika. Especially Adhidaivika and Adhibhautika, he puts together and calls them natural disturbances. And he gives a few examples, like uh, one is, he says, Vata sickness. He mentions that in his commentary. And for all these different disturbances, he gives interesting solutions. So I was not planning to go into these things because I thought I don't want to take it away from tomorrow's speaker. But some, someone recommended I should still share it, so I'm going to share that. So uh, I'll, I'll mention a disturbance and then I'll mention the solutions he gives. So for vata sickness, he mentions yoga asanas and pranayam. And then another disturbance is heat, which is quite relevant for us now. Uh, he, he gives a, a solution of moon meditation. You can just stare at the moon, unblinking. And cold is another disturbance. And the solution he gives is sun meditation. Surya Namaskar or whatever other thing you want to do. Uh, the next disturbance is bad planets. Actually, he, he, he puts three together. Bad planets, snakes, and everything else. And he says the solution is uh, medicine, uh, mantras, and austerities. So this is Adi Daivaka and Adi Bhautaka. Then he goes into Adi Atmika. And he just mentions three disturbances. One is lust. And he says the solution to lust is meditation on me, on the Lord. And the uh, second disturbance is pride and hypocrisy. And he gives the solution of following uh, previous acharyas, masters. And the, the third is everything else. And the solution he gives is Nam Sankirtan. Right there, if you look at the Sanskrit, it mentions Nam Sankirtan. For all other Adi Atmika disturbances. Okay, and the third point I wanted to speak about is how the Lord can be glorified. And I already hinted at it, as it's to see that the Lord is so accommodating. Okay, he sees that the living entity is not able to accept what he's offering. Okay, then try this. A little less, a little less. So we, like I, I gave the exam, like I gave the breakdown of this chapter, like seven, sorry, five stages he gives. Okay, if you're not able to be a liberated uh, jnani, okay, then try to be an unperfected uh, jnani. If you're not able to do that, then one level lower. And uh, in the Bhagavad Gita also, this is very nicely explained. I'm sure all of you are th uh, Many of you are thinking of uh, what I'm thinking of, which is chapter 12. That uh, different stages from text 8 to text 12. I wanted to create some context for that. Uh, the beginning of the chapter, Arjuna is asking, which is better? Devotional service or focusing on the uh, impersonal Brahman? And like I mentioned earlier, immediately uh, Krishna gives an answer, direct. He says it's devotional service in text 2. But then in text 3 he says, those who focus on the impersonal Brahman, they also attain me. So again, accommodating. That's what a compassionate person does. And then he says, but it takes a long time. Play show de text 5. Then he says in text uh, 6 and 7 that those who do devotional service, they swiftly make progress. So we see it's like, it seems to be black and white, right? Slow or fast. But then uh, the Lord gives a gray area from text 8 to 12. Uh, so he first says that my, uh, my uh, how's that verse go? Text 8. Yeah, so to just constantly think of me, engage your intelligence in me. Yeah, my Eva, my Yeah. 
if one's not able to do that, then engage in regulated devotional service. If one's not able to do that, then give the results of one's activities. If not that, then to give up the one's work. And number five is meditation. And number six is cultivating knowledge. The Gani. <coughs> six things. <coughs> and also in Bhagavatam, <coughs> there's a section which I found very interesting, very relevant. It's uh, in the sixth canto. So, <coughs> the devatas, they're really in anxiety because Ritrasur is very, very powerful. So, they offer a series of prayers to the Lord. And usually, <coughs> uh, demigods cannot directly access the Lord. Usually they have to go, to go through Lord Brahma. But here, the Lord very mercifully, directly appears before them. This is in the sixth canto, chapter 9, uh, text 48. So, when the Lord appears, they offer some more prayers. And these prayers are very elaborate. The, the previous ones were general, now they're very elaborate. And they're speaking so many nice philosophical points. But inside, uh, because they're mixed devotees, like they, they, they mention their agenda. They, three times, if you look at the series of verses, they mention about uh, Vritrasura. Please save us from Vritrasura. Please kill Vritrasura. <laughs> so then the Lord responds. This is how he responds. He says, Oh, best of the intelligent demigods, Although it is true that nothing is difficult for one to obtain when I am pleased with him, a pure devotee whose mind is exclusively fixed upon me does not ask me for anything but the opportunity to engage in devotional service. So again, direct, like, straightforward answer. Uh, this is Vishwana Chakravarti Thakur's commentary. He says, how unfortunate you praised me with that knowledge, but out of foolishness you did not pray for bhakti. Text 49. Those who think material assets to be everything or to be the ultimate goal of life are called misers. So he's, in, he's indirectly calling them misers. They do not know the ultimate necessity of the soul. Moreover, if one awards that which is desired by such fools, he must also be considered foolish. So, and now Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur gives a very interesting uh, commentary. He says, the Lord is speaking, though you are fools desiring material benefits and do not know what is good and bad for you, how can I, in knowledge, give those things to you? And then the, uh, the example is given is, the mother does not knowingly give her son poison. One <clears throat> who sees material objects as the goal of life does not know his own good. If one who, fault, if one who knows the goal of life gives him those things, he is also a fool. And uh, text 50. A pure devotee who is fully accomplished in the science of devotional service will never instruct a foolish person to engage in fruitive activities for material enjoyment, not to speak of helping him in such activities. Such a devotee is like an experienced physician who never... <clears throat> encourages a patient to eat food injurious to his health, <clears throat> even if the patient desires it. In text 51, O oh, Magavan, Indra, all good fortune unto you. I advise you to approach the exalted saint Dadichi. He has become very accomplished in knowledge, 
vows and austerity, and his body is very strong. Go ask him for his body without delay. So what, what happened here? So the Lord could understand the mind of especially Indra and the other demigods. So again, he says, this is the highest, but for you, you should, my advice is you should approach Dadichi and ask for his bones, make that thunderbolt, and then you can kill Vitrasura. So, a few days ago, Raja Chandra Prabhu was reading uh, from Prabhupada Memories book, uh, 12.30, and he was narrating one uh, pastime that Maruviza Prabhu was relating that happened in Australia. One, maybe some of you were there, one gentleman in a three-piece suit, like very aristocratic, very well-dressed, he meets Srila Prabhupada, they have a conversation. And they discuss many things, but one thing they discuss is uh, sex life. And how if someone is just focused on sex life, then they have a doggish mentality. So the man, he's very honest, he's like, well then, I like, I like that very much. And Prabhupada, just see how expert, he did not say, well, then you are a dog. He says, well, if, uh, you know, A, if you're A and A leads to B, then you must be B. So like this, he says, then you must, then, then it seems you have a doggish mentality. And the man said, okay, I'm okay with that. In other words, Srila Prabhupada, he would sometimes make very heavy points. Not to... Uh, depress that person, not to discourage that person, but actually to encourage him, to try to create some transformation. But he was seeing that this person was not undergoing any transformation. <laughs> so then he said, bring him prasadam. And that, like, the prasadam was gulab jamins. The man did not have any adhikar. Uh, of course, it was being created by association with Srila Prabhupada. But he said, no, I'm not interested. I'm not hungry. But Srila Prabhupada kept insisting. And somehow he managed him to at least hold the gulab jamin. And the gulab jamin was very nicely made. And it was uh, leaking a lot of syrup. And it was going down his wrist onto his uh, suit. And then he was trying to deal with the syrup and it just made things worse. So Prabhupada kept telling him, eat it, eat it, eat it. So finally he put it into his mouth and it made even more of a mess all over his face. And after he finished it, he said, oh, it's very nice. He said, can I have another one? So Prabhupada gave him another one. <clears throat> and the man said, oh, this will be very nice in my rum. And Prabhupada said, this is prasadam. This is, this is the mercy of the Lord. You do not put it in your rum. So the, the conversation kept going back and forth. And uh, Prabhupada convinced him not to put it in his rum as he was leaving. So I give this as an example to show, like Prabhupada was accommodating, but at the same time there was a line. So also we see this with the Lord. Like he's very accommodating, but at the same time there's a line. And if you go beyond that line, then, then it's, you know, it's your choice. Uh, and the uh, last point I want to speak about is uh, a couple minutes. Uh, these three personalities, Sita Devi, Madhupandit, and Janava Devi. So, as Radish Alper was saying, April is Ram, like Ramkata is what we should speak. Uh, Raja Chandrapur was saying, but we can speak still a little Ramkata now because it's the beginning of May. So, but so much Ramkata has been spoken. So I thought what I should speak. So I just wanted to focus on one very little uh, 
pastime. And I just want to show how Sita had a spotless character. Like, uh, and so I want to elaborate on the, the Lakshman Rekha pastime. Why did Sita criticize uh, Lakshman so heavily? And after that, why did then when Lakshman was like shaken and he left, then why did she leave that circle, that protective circle? These were two, two things I wanted to uh, address to illustrate Sita's uh, spotless character. So, to first uh, uh, understand uh, why Sita became so critical of Lakshman. Uh, see, before Ram left, he, he instructed Lakshman, please take care of Sita. And Sita obviously heard. So, Sita doesn't want uh, any instruction, whether it's direct or indirect, to be disobeyed, any instruction of Ram. So she wouldn't want to um, create disturbance to Lakshman and then Lakshman is not able to follow that instruction, right? But there are always exceptions to the rule. And as my understanding goes is that she saw this as an exception, that here is Ram, he's in trouble. And so that was, the, that was the first point I wanted to make. She saw it as an exception. And the second point is she doesn't directly, anyway, we all know what she eventually says, but before that, she, she, she tells Lakshman, you are the younger brother and Ram is the older brother, you should uh, go to the aid of your older brother. He's like your guru in some ways. Then the third point uh, she makes is that you just want me, you just want to enjoy me for yourself. That really shakes up uh, Lakshman. And then she says that Ram is the leader. So if he goes, everything goes. And all you're left with is me. So it doesn't equate. <laughs> better, better you go for the everything you, than to protect little old me. It's an expression of humility, actually. And the last point she goes to is that I cannot live without Ram. So then, you know, she becomes very emotional. So these five points uh, causes Lakshman to go. And now the Lakshman Rekha aspect, like uh, why she left the circle. Well, I was doing some research and uh, I'm sure many of you know, in uh, the Gita Press Ramayan, actually there's no mention of the circle. It mentions how Ravana comes disguised as a sadhu and Sita, being very cultured, she wants to offer him some food and uh, interestingly, she thinks, oh, I don't want to displease the sage, so I'll start speaking about what's going on. Uh, not to, so, I, so I don't want him to curse me it's mentioned like that. So she's talking about the history, how they ended up there in the forest. And then finally, uh, she, she asks, so who are you? Uh, what lineage are you coming in? What ashram do you belong to? And then, you know, someone may look very beautiful, very saintly, but as soon as they open their mouth, then you know the consciousness. So immediately, he said, I am Ravana. <laughs> and he talks about all his glories, all of what he, what he did. And uh, Sita, she, and then of course he ends by saying, I want you. And she, she's a, a Kshatriya lady. She becomes very 
heavy, like strong with Ravana. She's chastising him and she's, she just, she's not fearful. And she's like saying, Ram will destroy you, etc. Finally, Ravana becomes so angry, he loses his sadhu, Vesh, and he becomes this gigantic demon he is. And he then is able to overpower her and grabs her and takes her away. So, now the, the version of the circle, in Agni Purana it mentions that Ravana convinced Sita to leave the circle by, again, uh, 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 threatening Sita that if you do not come out of the circle, I will curse not you, but your husband. So she didn't want Ram to be cursed. She's always thinking about her husband, Ram. So therefore she came out of the circle. And a uh, little bit about Madhu Pandit. There's not much mentioned about Madhu Pandit, but I did, mention, I did manage to find something in Bhakti Ratnikar. Uh, but before I want to go into that, Madhu Pandit, uh, some of you may know, he uh, appeared in Bengal and he was an associate of Gadadar Pandit. He became actually a disciple. He used to go regularly from Bengal to uh, Puri with the group. But then at some point he had a very strong calling to go to Vrindavan. And he became the Pujari of the Gopinath Didi. And that was the service he performed the rest of his life. So Chaitanya Champa makes a nice point. He says like, uh, it's very nice to see a devotee who just does one service and perfects themselves, becomes liberated just doing one service. Because not only is it good for them, but it's good for us also to see an inspiration and also follow that kind of a path. So he went to Vrindavan, he became the Pajari of the Gopinath DT. And uh, uh, at around that time, Srinivasacharya, Narutam Das Thakur, and Shamananda Pandit were there. And the political situation was not very stable. Plus, they wanted to go to Gaudadesh, which is Bengal and uh, Orissa, and they wanted to preach. But they thought, if we want to preach, we need to have some substance. We need to have some books. So that's how, these two reasons. Political instability, and they wanted to have some tangible, um, tangible knowledge in the form of books. So therefore, they decided to take that cartload of books from Vrindavan to Gaudadesh. And in, in Bhakti Ratnakar, it's very nicely described how these three devotees, they go all over Vrindavan getting blessings from different senior devotees. Uh, I'll just read this section, it's very sweet. So Lokanath Goswami was, in one, some ways he was actually more senior than the six Goswamis because he, uh, he had come to Vrindavan earlier than them. So they approach, Jiva Goswami is with them and they approach uh, Lokanath Goswami. Sri Jiva and the others bowed. Yeah. They bowed at the feet of uh, Lokanath Goswami. And Lokanath Goswami was sitting mesmerized by the beautiful face of Radha Vinod. So he was like, totally absorbed. And Lokanath Goswami was greatly moved by the affection, by affection when Jiva Goswami arrived. And Jiva Goswami informed, tomorrow morning Srinivas will leave for Gaudadesh. See, of the three, Srinivas Acharya, Shamananda Pandit, and Nortam Nas Thakur, Srinivas Acharya was the, the leader. So he's mentioned a lot here. Uh, Lokana turned to Radhavinod and offered a prayer and then gave mala prasad to Srinivas. In affection, he told Srinivas and others 
many things which cannot be narrated here. The three devotees bowed on the ground at his feet. With tears in his eyes and a heavy heart, Lokanath Goswami embraced each of them. Composing himself, Jiva, uh, uh, Sri Goswami, uh, Sri Goswami is Lokanath Goswami, uh, to, uh, he told Sri, Sri Jiva, all of them are in your care. In humility, in humility, Sri Jiva bowed with the others at the feet of Lokanath, and then they left. Thereafter, they visited the deity of Sri Gopinath. The beautiful posture of Sri Gopinath had attracted the whole world. The hearts of the devotees was transformed by the beauty of Gopinath and their feelings defy description. Srinivas requested Madhu Pandit, the Pujari, and others, <clears throat> and others to pray for the safe journey <clears throat> of Srinivas. Madhu Pandit prayed to Gopinath and gave a garland from Sri Gopinath to Srinivas as a token of the permission, this is the point, permission granted by the deity. To offer his respects, Srinivas lay prostrate on the ground with tears of love in his eyes before taking leave of the deity. The devotees consoled Srinivas and requested him to return to Vrindavan again. Because you see, this was a, a, a journey overland. They were going to take this cart walking. They, ne they never knew if they were e e ever going to see Vrindavan again, actually. They also showered grace on Shamananda and Narottam. Uh, but what they said is beyond my power of description. The devotees of Gopinath embraced Srinivas and the others in great love and then bowed at their feet by prostrating, by prostrating themselves on the ground. You see a lot of obeisances taking place. Madhu Pandit and the others assured Sri Jiva that at the time of departure, the next morning, they would meet at the Govinda Mandir. So the plan was, during the day, these three are getting blessings from all of the saints of Vrindavan, and next morning, the party will leave. And many of those saints were invited to be there for that depart departure the next morning. And Madhu Pandit goes. So that night, this is what happens. Uh, Srinivas. The anxiety which tore the heart of Srinivas is known only to Sri Govinda. By the will of Govinda, Srinivas fell asleep in the late hours of the night. So most of the night he wasn't sleeping. In his dream, Sri Govinda left the temple and went to Srinivas, walking with the gait of an elephant, defeating the beauty of the whirl of the lotus flower. Govinda's beauty put hundreds of gods to shame. He was uh, adorned by jewelry and wore the feather of a peacock on his head. He had long eyes and his body was well designed. The beauty of his face defeated the beauty of hundreds of moons. For his own pleasure, Sri Govinda, Dev, told Srinivas, smiling, O oh, Srinivas, stop lamenting, for it is causing me great pain. Do you not know that you are the embodiment of my love and I am always with you? I have expressed my desires through Rupa and Sanatan. Through your distribution of these books, this is the Lord speaking, through your distribution of these books, I shall destroy the grief of mankind and give them the wealth of love. I promise I shall accept anyone who takes shelter of you. So he's not asking them to bring them to him. He's saying, you accept them as your disciples. Whoever becomes your disciple shall be very fortunate. You should take them with you and perform Sankirtan. Never worry about anything. From time to time, you will see me in the same way. So having consoled Srinivas, Sri Govinda then transformed himself into Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. 
And Srinivas could not contain himself as he begged for a hundred eyes to see the form of the Lord. He worshipped the Lord's feet by falling on the ground and Chaitanya placed his feet on Srinivas's head. The Lord embraced Srinivas and bid him farewell for his journey to Gaudadesh. Then he abandoned or he left his Chaitanya form and he entered the temple. Upon the disappearance of Sri Govinda, Srinivas became emotionally torn and when his sleep broke, he saw that it was dawn. After performing his morning duties, okay, uh, then there's this whole going away ceremony that happens. So, yeah, that's a little bit about, a little bit about Madhu Pandit. And the last thing I wanted to uh, speak about is Janava Devi. Again, I, I'm going to read from Bhakti Ratnakar. There's actually some very nice uh, pastimes here about Janava Devi. I'm just going to focus on two small pastimes. Uh, the first is uh, an experience with uh, Chandi. So, this, so she's traveling, she's preaching, going from village to village. So she, she goes through a large village and she wanted to stop there for some time. But she heard that the village was the residence of many heretics uh, who continually harassed the Vaishnavas. That evening, the devotees of the village came forward to meet uh, Janava and bowed at her feet, while the heretics gathered around criticizing the Vaishnavas that they had no knowledge and therefore they bowed to a human being instead of worshipping demigods. One villager thought that perhaps the Vaishnavas bowing to her thinking she was the personification of goddess Chandi. What do, what do these Vaishnavas know of the grace of Sri Chandi? And another villager in rebuttal, said another villager in rebuttal. The simple villagers felt they might have offended Sri Chandi by comparing her <laughs> to, Shri, to, to Janava. So they went immediately to the temple of Sri Chandi and prayed that she might kill the foolish Vaishnavas. Then they all returned to their houses and went to sleep. Goddess Chandi, however, became angry, not with the Vaishnavas, but with the foolish heretics, and her eyes grew red while her lips quivered in anger. Carrying a sharp sword, she appeared in the dream of each of those villagers. Like, this is, this is like, if, if, some, if a group of people all have the same dream, that's significant. And, uh, what happened? She was the person. She raised her sword to kill each heretic simultaneously chastising them for considering Janava an ordinary Brahmin woman. Janava was the wife of Nityananda who was himself the incarnation of Balaram and was to be worshipped by the whole universe and even by Chandi herself. Uh, Janava was com competent to carry the living entities over their miseries and fears of this world. She was a person personification of love and kindness and had no interest but showing mercy on the living entities. She warned them that if they did not try to get the mercy of Janava, then her mighty sword would send them to eternal damnation. In a roaring fury, Goddess Chandi spoke to the village people and then disappeared. So remember, Chaitanya Leela, it's all about creating heart transformation, not killing people. So even here, Chandi didn't kill anyone, just in their dreams, she threatened them. Then they all awoke, they were shivering, shivering in fear, they realized their dangerous situation. When morning arrived, they went straight to meet the Mahantas, carrying deep remorse within their hearts. Soaked by their own tears of self-condemnation, the villagers fell at the feet of the Mahantas and prayed for forgiveness. They wanted the mercy of the Mahantas, knowing that if the Mahantas forgave them, surely Janava would also forgive them. So they didn't go directly to Janava, they went through the devotees of the town. They admitted their guilt and prayed for an opportunity to take shelter of her feet. 
observing their humble and repentant mood, the Mahantas forgave them and she, Janava, also accepted them. Jai. So I think we'll end there. So in conclusion, uh, we spoke about uh, four things. We went into the flow of this chapter. We spoke about uh, disturbance. We spoke about how the Lord is accommodating. And then we spoke about these three personalities. All right, Krishna, thank you. Srimad Bhagavatam ki jai. Srila Prabhupada ki jai.